Hello and welcome to the first of our Advent series in this time just before Christmas. So we're taking a break in our series of, in John because we have entered that period in the Christian calendar known as Advent. Advent means coming or arriving and for Christians this is a time where we celebrate the coming of Jesus all those years ago and we also wait in eager anticipation for his second coming. And so this period is a time of spiritual preparation, a time when we make ourselves ready for the birth of Christ, not just from thousands of years ago, but the birth of Christ in our hearts today. We daily invite Christ to reside in us and to grow in us. We probably all celebrate Advent in different ways, but we can use this time to refocus ourselves on Christ, to remind ourselves that he is the centre of our lives. Over the last couple of years, one of the ways that I've been um, celebrating Advent is to take part in Advent challenges, which asks us to take a picture of something that represents to us a different given word relating to Advent, Christmas, Jesus, and then to write a little summary of what it means to us. And I found these challenges inspiring, helping me to think about the meaning of this time much more than I normally would. I also found it quite challenging as I find myself reflecting upon concepts and thoughts about Christmas, Advent or God that I don't normally reflect on. How do you observe the season of Advent? What might you do this year to draw your focus to Jesus and to prepare in anticipation of his arrival? The four Sundays in Advent are traditionally cel celebrated in many churches with the lighting of Advent candles representing the themes of Christmas. There are slight differences in what these ca candles represent, but many follow the idea that the candles represent hope, love, joy and peace. Each week I will be light lighting a candle, which this week is the candle of hope. We remember that in Jesus, we are given certain hope. So let's light that first candle. Let's pray. Jesus, light of the world, we thank you for coming and bringing us hope. Showing us that there is hope for a future and hope for the present. We thank you, Lord God. And we pray that we will all experience hope this week. Amen. In our reflections during Advent, we are going to be looking at the fact that love came down at Christmas and revealed to us justice, life, forgiveness, and God's presence. So this week we're considering love came down at Christmas to reveal justice. So I'm going to read from Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 9 and Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 4. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teachings the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, 
and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. And then from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendour. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. It is apt that this Sunday, the Advent candle is lit to represent hope because Jesus' arrival was foretold long before his birth. And these prophecies gave God's people hope. Hope for a time when there is no more injustice and people are treated with compassion and love. We live in a world of survival of the fittest, where many people are squashed underfoot because they are considered by others as worthless or weak. But Jesus came to bring hope to this world, to show people the reality of the kingdom of God, the upside down nature of God's rule, where the weak are strong and the powerless are given power. Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim freedoms for the captives. Love came down at Christmas to reveal the meaning of justice, to bring justice to the earth. So what is this justice? Well, firstly, it's gentle yet powerful. God's upside down understanding of the way the world works and the way it should work turns our understanding of things on its head. <clears throat> we often equate the pursuit of justice with might and force. We talk about fighting for justice and sometimes violence is excused in the name of justice. Because injustice can seethe inside of us, creating in us hatred, rage, bitterness, helplessness, and a desire for vengeance and revenge. But we see in our passage for today that justice is gentle, yet also powerful. We are told, here is my servant, he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In these words, we see a strained combination of both power and vulnerability. Justice will come to the nations, but not by might or force, but by the gentle compassion and love Jesus has for people. God has every right to send down his wrath upon the world, and yet instead he sent love to come down at Christmas. It is a fact of life that gentleness often de-escalates violent situations, volatile situations, maybe not instantly, maybe not easily, but bit by bit, when people see continual gentleness, compassion and love for other human beings, they will be impacted by it. And we have seen clear examples of this in our history, when we look back at great heroes of justice, such as Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, Mother Teresa, to name just a few. These amazing people chose to respond to the injustice of the world with non-violent, gentle, compassionate resistance. And Jesus embodies this gentle justice perfectly by coming as love into the world to take on the pain and violence of our sin and rebellion against God. 
but it needs to be noted that gentle justice is absolutely not the same as silence or inaction. Compassion does not allow for complicity with injustice. Gentle justice is still justice. It still works against injustice. In Isaiah 42, he says, he will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his teachings, the islands will put their hope. And Isaiah 61 reminds us that Jesus' justice is not quiet. It is not feeble. It proclaims good news, the year of the Lord's favour. It restores the brokenhearted and releases prison from prisoners from darkness. Jesus' ju justice is gentle, yes but it is certainly powerful. Isaiah 61 also reminds us of another important truth. Earlier I mentioned that injustice can build in us and lead to us wanting to seek revenge and take vengeance for ourselves against those perpetrating injustice. But we are reminded that vengeance belongs to God. He is the righteous and rightful judge and only he can bring judgment on the earth. So while we are called to work towards justice, we are also reminded to leave vengeance to God. It is a delicate but important balance to maintain as revenge and vengeance are, is not ours to take. We need to follow Jesus' example of gentle justice and leave vengeance in the hands of the only one who is truly worthy to deal it out. So God's justice is gentle and it is also God driven and yet he works through us. The reason that this kind of gentle justice works is because it is mandated and driven by God. No weapon formed can stand against the power and purposes of God. Isaiah reminds us that God is the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. God made the heavens and the earth. Everything in it belongs to him. It is because of God that we even have breath in our lungs. Therefore, since God works through gentle justice, it is capable of standing against any force, weapon or resistance that we can put against it. God's justice demonstrates how the world is supposed to be without sin and rebellion to his perfect ways mucking it up. It is only by the power and purposes of God that justice can ever prevail. And ultimately, God's justice will prevail forever. God gives us a glimpse of this. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. But amazingly, God chooses to fulfil his plans by working in and through us. He says to us, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the, for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. God chooses to invite us to be part of his plan to bring justice to the earth. But this is only ever possible because God puts his spirit in us. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on us. The Holy Spirit works in us so that we act in his power and his purpose. We are called to do the works of God by standing up against injustice, both for ourselves and for others. It can be easy to fall into the temptation to believe that following Christ means that we only have to turn up to church on a Sunday sing some songs, pray some prayers, and listen to someone like me preach a sermon. 
But passages like these blow that assumption out of the water because God commissions us to go to open eyes that are blind, proclaim good news, comfort those who mourn. Wherever we have been placed by God, in our homes, our families, our neighbourhoods, our communities, our social settings, our doctor's surgeries, our shopping trips, wherever it is, we are responsible to work for justice there. Wherever we go, we carry the power of God with us. And so too, we carry the charge to seek justice everywhere we tread. So thirdly, justice is for all, yet it is also personal. The very definition of justice demands that it is, it is for everyone. No one should ever be excluded from being treated with justice, no matter if they are people we like and respect, or if they're people we find represent, reprehensible. Justice is for everyone. Isaiah reminds us that God calls for justice to be established, not just in Israel or among the Jewish people. Justice is to be established in the earth, with even the smallest island receiving God's justice. Thinking of this universal justice and what it would mean for us to live in a world like that is kind of mind blowing. There's a song, quite old now, by Graham Kendrick called God of the Poor, Beauty for Brokenness, that I always really like, and the words really speak powerfully to me. It calls out to this kind of justice, where each verse speaks of the world being made right, with even the world itself being renewed. Beauty for brokenness, work for the craftsman, land for the dispossessed, refuge from cruel wars, rest for the ravaged earth, ocean and streams. This is the promise of the justice of God. Just imagine living in such a world. So justice is for all, but it is also personal. Sometimes when we think about something being universal, it becomes abstract, distant, impersonal and sometimes even irrelevant to individual lives. But God's justice is not just universal, it is personal. It is for each and every one. No one is to be overlooked. That means that justice is for you and me. There may be something that is personal to you that you want or need justice in. God offers that justice. He wants you to know his justice, his peace, the hope of his coming coming not just to and for the world as a whole, but coming to and for you, because you are precious and beautiful in God's sight. He loves you and wants you to know justice, true justice, not the flawed justice we see in the world, but true justice that looks at you as the person you are, not looking through eyes blinded by stereotypes, prejudices or biases. God looks at you and sees you. Take courage in knowing that you are seen and known intimately by the God of justice, who wants you to be valued for who you are. Love came down at Christmas and revealed to us justice. Jesus came down to demonstrate what God's kingdom is like, and he invites you into his kingdom empowering you to be agents of his gentle justice through the power of the Spirit. God invites you to know his justice personally for yourself and to seek it for all people. As you prepare for Advent, for Jesus' coming, let the Holy Spirit fill you with his justice and hope. Ask God to help you see the world and all people with his eyes. Amen.